Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to Occult Perspectives. Um, Tyler Smith here to bring you uh, more knowledge, light, um, information on esoteric subjects, um, the occult in general. Today I wanted to give a brief introduction of the tarot. So tarot cards are more than just a fortune telling or a divination system. They can be used for that, but it's also an archetypal map. Um, essentially, every archetype that could exist within us is somewhat symbolized by um, particularly the 22 major arcana. Those are the more important cards, um, the ones that people generally focus on um, when they're doing any kind of reading or anything like that. And the 22 major arcana can also be integrated into the tree of life. So each little path on here that connects the 10 sephirot, or sephirot, we'll get into that later. Um, I'll definitely be doing a lot of videos on the tree of life because it's such an extensive subject. Here it is. If you look at this little map, of the tree of life you can actually see which cards are which path that's hard to see on that camera so here you have the hanged man there's the devil that brown line justice etc etc and the number 22 has a lot of other um, major implications which we'll go into at a later time but the tarot um, there's a lot of debate as to the history of it, there is a more of a myth version. And that version, um, essentially Thoth, the Atlantean, or the Egyptian um, priest king, he was always kind of the one behind the scenes. He was never the one ruling, but he would always be, um, he would always be there like an advisor for the king to help out the king. Um, and they say that Thoth gave 22 pictures or what would be the major arcana of the tarot to the mystery cult of Egypt. Um, that in a nutshell is kind of the mythological viewpoint. There's other myth stories too that they haven't really proven. Um, as far as the actual history of tarot that there is in recorded history um, I'm going to reference uh, Modern Magic once again. I did so in the last video. Give me just a moment here. Aha. Uh, we do have historical records of the following facts. The first mention of the tarot was made in 1332 by Alphonse... 11 king of leon and castile he banned them along with other gambling games yeah there's also the idea that the modern um card playing games originated from tarot and i'm sure that's probably the case um yeah the tarot is the real deal um, those cards are definitely worth um, studying really for a lifetime i like to play you know playing card games too but yeah, the tarot is definitely much more of a serious um, intellectual and philosophical endeavor and one that should be pursued for one who is truly on the path. There's other kinds of cards too. Um, I've actually seen many different kind of cards. Um, I just got from my girlfriend recently um, a pack of Lumerian cards and it doesn't they don't work in quite the same format as the tarot, but they're beautifully made cards, and um, they seem very, very interesting. And it's kind of the same where you um, can do predictions for the future, and I'm going to get into that in a moment. The difference between divination and fortune telling. Uh, there's a big difference there. But a couple of these other um, historical facts. Um, in 1337, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing these names right, Yuan's a German monk, wrote that they could be used to teach morality. That's kind of funny. Anyway, there's a couple of 
other um, historical facts here, but none of them clearly point to the beginning of the Terra, so we're not sure um, exactly where it originates from. I've actually have some of the um, major arcana laid out here on the table. Um, I didn't really have room for all 22. And they say when you're first working with the tarot cards too, that you actually want to, um, with the major arcana, there's a couple cards you want to take out that just typically have negative connotations from the beginning. And that would be the devil. And I believe the tower is another one of those. Um, in modern magic, it tells you um, which cards to take out uh, when you're first um, working with the tarot. And those two are definitely um, some of the cards. And the reason for that um, is they just don't want beginners to get confused because they're not necessarily evil cards per se. Um, you know, the devil doesn't really mean like evil. It could just mean uh, more physical or things that bind us or... Um, yeah, carnal versus um, celestial, and that can be seen with the inverted pentagram, um, the upside down pentagram. It's not necessarily evil per se, although it's primarily probably used for that purpose because um, it's kind of a desecration. Whenever the dark occult uses symbols, they desecrate um, a symbol that was originally used for good because the upright pentagram you have the spiritual nature of man, you have the three points above the two points, but when you turn the pentagram, um, when you turn the pentagram upside down, it's duality above the trinity, so you're really revering um, physical existence over spiritual existence. Um, that's just one of the many symbologies of the pentagram. Um, I could do an entire lecture on that if I compiled some information. Sorry, I'm jumping around so much. I just have so much um, information that I want to get out. And um, if you have any questions or anything, please feel free to comment. So anyway, um, I'll let you take a look at the cards again real quick. The difference between um, divination and fortune telling is divination is basically tells you Based on the reading, if you go down that path, if you decide to make that choice, um, you have a choice. Um, it's saying this is what will happen if you pursue this course. Whereas fortune telling says this is going to happen no matter what. This is your fate. So divination more or less gives you the choice to make. It has a little more free will to it. And when you do divination, you don't want to ask, should I do this? Um, is... Donald Craig um, mentions in Modern Magic, the cards are not like a pseudo-mommy. Um, they're not your parents. Um, you're supposed to inquire and ask what will happen if I go down this path, not should I. So the ultimate choice is up to you. Um, fortune telling says something must happen. Um, they're two very different things. Um, I will go ahead and explain the tarot contemplation ritual. So in the last video, we talked about the relaxation ritual. And this little ritual comes immediately after the relaxation ritual. It would usually be used to um, at the end of your practices. But for now, since the relaxation ritual is the only other thing, um, this would be the immediate next step. And basically, you take the 22, here, I'll go ahead and collect them since I have them here. You'll take the 22 major arcana. And you'll actually want to put them in order from zero at the top to 22 at the bottom. And then you'll end up shuffling them in any manner or form that you choose. And then you'll pick a card. And see here, we got the fool. And all you do is um, you empty your mind, no preconceived notion, you know, just observe and absorb. 
but try not to think of any thoughts. Just allow the card by simply looking at it, what comes to your mind. What does it mean archetypally? What does it mean to you? Because the cards have multitudes of meanings, but the most important thing, and this is what I like about the tarot personally, um, is that when I get a card, I know what it's telling me. The message is usually pretty clear, and that's why it's such a great tool. That's why people may want to get, you know, caught up on which tarot deck's better, um, or is there any validity to their history? Like, where did they actually come from? But the important thing is, is it's a tool that works, and it works very well. Um, sorry, I'm getting off track again. But as you observe the card, you do this for about two minutes, and then you um, you want to write down, you know, any thoughts, emotions, um, phenomena that may have happened, anything you may have perceived. And you can also hold the tarot up to your third eye as well when you're doing this contemplation. And that may help you get a better visualization. And you want to record that in your magical diary, um, which I have not gotten into yet. Um, but real quick, um, before um, I get into not the magical diary, but the other diary or log, which is important, which is a dream diary. Um, I'll get into that in just a moment. Um, I'm going to wrap up this small tarot lesson. Um, so you do the tarot contemplation, and that, after the relaxation ritual, would be the end of your curriculum for now. You know, if you're actually wanting to get, you need to do more research other than my videos if you're actually going to get started on the path of the Golden Dawn curriculum, which is pretty much what I follow for the most part. That's what Donald Craig promotes. Well, he doesn't so much promote it, but it's a very similar curriculum. It's the same rituals. Um, it starts out with the relaxation ritual, and then you learn the tarot contemplation, and then there is the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. But I, um, I wanted to introduce, you know, exactly what the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn is, for those of you who don't know. Um, it was a secret society based in Great Britain um, that differed a little bit from Freemasonry because women could join as well. So it was open to men and women. And um, where Freemasonry is more, I would consider pure ceremonial rather than ritual. I mean, it does have ritualistic aspects to it. But the Golden Dawn is actual high ceremonial magic as opposed to just um, ceremony. Which, that's really what ritual is, but it just has a more magical connotation. There's a lot more esoteric things going on, if that makes sense. Um, if you were to equate it to like high school and elementary school... Um, you know, Freemasonry uses a lot of historical context, such as King Solomon's temple um, and other biblical historical um, timeline things to explain their degree work, whereas the Golden Dawn kind of goes straight to the archetypes, and it works with the Tree of Life and the Tarot, and it's more of a primal archetypal magic rather than like a historic play. Masonry is more like a play. Um, it's an allegory veiled in... Um, symbolism. But anyway, back to the Golden Dawn. Um, it was the secret society that practiced this magic, and it had three founders, um, William Robert Woodman, William Wynn Westcott, and Samuel Little Mathers, and they were all Freemasons. Um, there's a really interesting story about how a manuscript was handed down from one Mason um, to another, which was... Um, I believe Westcott, and then he kind of decoded it and made a system out of it, and then that's where the Golden Dawn was formed. And he was said to have made contact with the hidden chiefs of the order, which are basically those that are never really seen. They are either uh, masters working in a higher realm that's not even here on the physical realm, or they're people or emissaries or ambassadors here on Earth that are communicating with those higher um, masters that are working on different realms. It starts to get really crazy, but 
um, the story goes is they got permission from one of these higher chiefs to basically start these Golden Dawn Lodges. So, yeah, it all starts to become very, very interesting. Um, the last thing that I said I would cover is the Dream Journal. Um, I am guilty of not always staying on top of that. I actually just started my Dream Journal again last night. And you want to do dream journals because it creates a closer connection between your conscious and your subconscious. You're going to understand things a little bit more. Dreams are often symbols of things maybe we, not always things we want because we have nightmares and such. But if we understand the subconscious mind and how it works and what these dreams may be telling us, um, we can have better memory recall. That's one of the really good reasons for it. And then once you get on to further magical practices or meditation practices, you'll be able to astral travel a lot better if you can lucid dream, if you know that you're actually, you know, waking in your dream and then you can control it. I'm still not to this point. Um, I have a lot of trouble with that. In my diaries, um, it's just a bunch of random things and random people that I haven't even talked to or like seen in a really, really long time. So for me personally, one of my goals, especially in the next year or so, is to gain more control over these dreams. And I guess to do so, keeping the dream journal or diary is a really, really good thing. Because you'll probably remember places and things the more you write them down. And you'll be like, oh, I do remember this. And then you'll be able to consciously, in your dreams, do astral travels and other exercises such as that. So the dream journal, it's just a really good thing to have. It's a really good habit. Um, to get into. Well, I think I pretty much covered everything I want to today. Um, keep a lookout for more videos. Um, please like this video if you liked it. Um, subscribe to my channel. Um, peace and blessings. Take care.